So my first question will go to uh, Dr. Elliott and then uh, Ms. Hansen, uh, uh, after Dr. Elliott has given her response. Uh, if you'd like to uh, add your thoughts, we'd appreciate that as well. Both of you in your testimony mentioned how duplication and uh, lack of consistency in administering the federal government's 1,900 grant programs uh, causes issues. Uh, we know that uh, notices of funding opportunities and rules for managing grants can, can vary, uh, sometimes substantially, from program to program. So I'd like you to tell this committee, uh, kind of dive in a little bit deeper uh, and tell this committee why that provides some real challenges uh, to your office or to the folks uh, that you uh, work with. Dr. Ellie, if you want to take the, the first uh, crack at that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Senator. Um, so certainly any inconsistencies can be a tremendous challenge for our office. Um, I would say that um, one of the, the best examples I could give would be in relation to how um, different agencies interpret um, uniform guidance and make exceptions or amendments to the uniform guidance and the differences that can happen across agencies when that happens, if you, especially if you're blending and braiding uh, funds together to make a more transformational impact. Um, so one example I think of all the time is um, in relation to our affordable housing program in Detroit. Um, so we've used funds from HUD, um, which allow for um, an exemption to the, the competitive award process for subrecipients, um, and that's allowable under HUD. Um, however, we have the exact same affordable housing program where we're using SLFRF dollars, um, where that uh, direct award to subrecipients is not allowable. Um, so we've gone through a competitive process for those, um, but the, the general confusion that that created for our staff and team on the front end to, to um, clarify to make sure that we were interpreting correctly and to go back and forth between the housing and grants management teams took a significant amount of time and effort and then um, in deploying those funds. So I think, um, you know, if to my colleagues' um, comments, if it's um, difficult to interpret for a professional grants management organization in a major American city, I can only imagine how challenging that would be um, to smaller municipalities or, um, or our subrecipient counterparts. Thank you. Mr. Hansen? So the, the current ARPA funding, the state and local fiscal recovery funding, at last count had over 90 individual guidance documents issued. Um, as you can imagine, trying to keep track of what the current set of rules are, um, what you can fund, what you can't fund, is a, a Herculean task. I'll take a step back, though, and talk about the notices of funding of availability or funding opportunity. Grants.gov is a wonderful solution. It's uh, you know, the, the front door for the federal grants process. The problem is when you uh, pull up a funding opportunity in grants.gov and you're faced with a 70-page notice of funding availability and it takes you three and a half hours to even figure out if you're eligible for the program or not. And, and that's really where some of the improvements need to start is breaking those notices of funding availability down into plain English, things that people can truly understand um, and not spend hours of staff time only to figure out that you're ineligible from applying. Um, so, you know, yes, there's a lot of areas for improvement post-award on the uh, compliance and guidance documents, but it really starts with the very first step, which is figuring out if you can even apply for a grant or not. Well, Mr. Answer, we, uh, this is something that drives me uh, crazy, especially uh, given what you're saying about how complicated this is and how it's difficult for particularly rural areas or smaller communities to do it. But we uh, have heard that uh, agencies like to give grants to applicants that have successfully received a grant. So unless you've already received a grant, it's really hard to get a grant, which makes uh, no sense because those uh, communities that haven't received a grant are probably oftentimes uh, in the greatest uh, need for those grants. So my question for you, Mr. Hansen, is you know, how, would you, how would you priorities? What should the federal government do, be doing right now to make sure that we're reaching high need communities, uh, even if those communities haven't had the experience of getting a grant because of the complexity of getting the grant uh, in the first place. How would you prioritize some action items that this committee should be considering in that area? Thank you for the question, Senator. Um, and it, it really is fundamental <clears throat> grants management capacity development. There are you know, not only the philanthropic organizations I mentioned who are out there doing wonderful work, uh, but even organizations like the Appalachian Regional Commission and others who are really committed to uh, building grants management capacity. Uh, historically, uh, federal agencies do a wonderful job of training and technical assistance of their grantees. Um, you know, they have wonderful relationships, you know, wraparound services, but what's really missing is the, you know, the future applicant, the, the city out there, the nonprofit out there, 
who you know, needs the funding, has the critical resources, and there's nobody out there really providing generic grants management capacity development. Um, and I really think if the federal agencies, you know, many of the programs receive technical assistance funding with their programs, if part of that training and technical assistance money was invested in just generic grants 101, building grants management capacity would really help. Uh, you know, we see, um, you know, especially with these, the non-entitlement units of the local government, they don't know where to start. They don't know the, the terminology. They don't know, you know, you talk about the Federal Uniform Guidance or 2 CFR 200, and you're, you're speaking another language, and it shouldn't be that way. So we really need to take a step back and invest in fundamental training and grants management development to make sure that our underserved communities, our under-resourced communities, both rural and urban, are not left behind with all the funding that's out there right now. Great, thank you. Mr. Arkett, in, in your testimony, you highlighted the importance of collaboration, coordination, and information sharing across all these agencies that are awarding these grants. Uh, would you uh, discuss uh, for the committee the current state of coordination efforts as you see it across the, the federal government and, and uh, what can we do to improve that coordination if you say that there are some shortfalls? Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, it, you know, coordination is a challenge. There are a lot of different grant programs in any given area uh, and sometimes it can be hard to know does that, uh, do those programs really overlap? Are they just fragmented? Do they have distinct purposes? Uh, and so that's really a first step, just figuring that out, making sure agencies are talking to one another, to coordinating, um, to meeting regularly, and to sharing information, to understand what they can do to remove any burdens that, uh, that are there for recipients when you do have that overlap or possible fragmentation, which can be difficult to manage. Is there a mechanism to do that now? Um, you know, there are, it, there's not a set structure necessarily. I think it's dependent on... Uh, the particular area. So for the, for the broadband example I, I mentioned, um, you know, there is discussion among some of the agencies, but there's no overarching structure uh, or strategy that the federal government, that the administration has to try to synchronize all of those programs. What would that look like if we were going to do that? Well, we've recommended that the administration develop a national strategy. Um, what we've heard in the response is that you know, they're considering it. Um, there have been some discussions and working groups, but we haven't seen an actual strategy that lays out how these 15 different federal agencies should be coordinating to make sure that there isn't potential waste of funds, that there isn't duplication of effort, uh, and that these different programs are, are synchronized to the extent that they can be. Dr. Elliott, this uh, question's for you. Um, we, we know that the federal government uses over uh, 190 different grants management software systems. That's a lot of software systems. Could you, could you tell this committee about some of the problems that your office faces uh, when you have so many different software portals that you have to uh, keep track of and have some degree of expertise on? Thank you, Senator, for the question. Um, yes, we, uh, we have a robust system of tracking. Um, the authorization requirements are significant for each of these systems. So uh, myself and Ms. Daniels, um, who's here with me today, we are typically the only um, or one of a small number of authorized users that can uh, sometimes be a bottleneck for some of the processes that we need to upload uh, for reports um, or applications. Um, I mentioned previously the um, the crashing of those systems um, and how significant that's been. I think that that's something I wouldn't bring up in front of this committee unless it was very, very important to us. Um, it's It happens all the time um, and is something that, uh, you know, is pretty demoralizing for the team when you can spend an entire work day, um, you know, trying to submit something and then the whole thing falls apart in the last minute. And again, our team has, has established a, a process of submitting um, for uh, reports and applications a week prior to the deadline to try and avoid that and it still happens. Um, so all of this um, kind of inconsistency has been challenging to us. Um, and I would say we're, again, you know, we have a significant amount of grants managers and folks that are very familiar with these portals that have relationships with our federal agency partners that can call them directly and we still have these challenges. So um, for, for other communities that don't have that same kind of access, it can be even more challenging. Thank you. Uh, also, uh, Dr. Elliott, in your testimony, uh, you told us that the city of Detroit took special care to give uh, sub-awards to organizations that had never received uh, grant money before. 
If you could tell the, the, the committee about how the city does that, uh, what are some of the barriers that you're attempting to overcome to uh, allow this to, to move forward, uh, and how we may uh, learn from that example in terms of uh, our thinking about how we prove the system. Thank you, Chairman, for that question. Um, this is something that we are very passionate about. So um, we have heard feedback from uh, small nonprofits and small businesses across the city um, that basically they don't, uh, it's hard enough for them to work with city government in the first place. They don't want anything to do with federal grants, um, which is really disheartening because there's so many opportunities to work together on these programs and either be the vendor that delivers the roof repair or um, the nonprofit that helps support our local kind of uh, workforce uh, programs. So what we've done specifically is we've partnered um, with third-party entities um, that basically serve as trusted local navigators. Um, so they seek out the folks that might be interested in, in applying for these opportunities, whether it's through, again, a, a contract that's out to bid um, or, or through a subrecipient opportunity that we issue. Um, and what those third-party entities do, and we, I should say we have no financial relationship with them whatsoever. They're, they're funded philanthropically. But what they do is they, they serve as that central navigator. Um, they, they take in folks, and they, they truly handhold with them the entire, you know, every step of the process. So um, how do I register for the system to even submit a bid to the city? What does that look like? Um, all the way through um, what is good documentation retention uh, policies? How do I submit invoices that are going to be compliant for a lot of these grant, um, these federal funds? So um, that's something that we've developed both, again, uh, for the small business sector locally, but then also for the nonprofit sector. We work with a couple different groups, and it's something we're really passionate about and would love to share with others who are looking to develop the same type of program. Wonderful. So my last question is going to be to, to all uh, three of you. I'll, I'll probably start with Mr. Arkin. We'll work down to Mr. Hansen here. Uh, as we, we've heard a lot uh, here today, uh, and there's a lot more that we, we need to hear uh, in the days, uh, weeks, and months ahead. But I always like to leave with a takeaway as to uh, what, what you think should be the biggest takeaway that my committee uh, gets from, from this hearing. Uh, so I'd like each of you to tell me what you think is the most important thing uh, that this uh, committee should uh, learn from the testimony that you gave today, what are some of the action steps that we should take to help this process? But similar to the question I asked earlier about Mr. Hansen, how do we prioritize? So what, what should be our major takeaway? If you were sitting on this committee and you had to prioritize something to, to really focus on, what would that be? Mr. Arkin. Uh, yeah, I think one thing to think about, and we, we talked a lot about, is sort of the upfront knowledge uh, on the availability of grants. Um, it's not something, again, where, where we've done a lot of work and we can, uh, are happy to continue our discussions with the committee to look into what we can do to support it. Um, but that, for me, is a, a big takeaway. Great. Dr. Elliott. Uh, thank you, Senator. For me, I think centrally coordinating grants management is really critical to um, every, every team that we work with in the city, and I can see that being a big challenge across the country. Um, so greater clarity and simplicity around how to deploy these dollars, um, strong definitions for beneficiaries, and how we define quasi-governmental entities would make a massive uh, uh, time difference in how we're able to get these dollars quicker to our communities, and it would create um, that more robust network of small businesses and nonprofits that we can work with. Thank you. Mr. Hansen? Uh, leverage and learn from uh, the, the projects that are going on right now outside of the federal government. So the center asked about how we can support Native American communities. The Native American Finance Officers Association has a grants training program at the University of New Mexico doing wonderful work. The other senator asked about the, the railway crossing program the, US, the National League of Cities, U.S. Conference of Mayors, Results for America, Bloomberg, and other philanthropic organizations have their local infrastructure hub where they're actually taking those small communities through an eight-module course to get them prepared to go after that program. Uh, there are states standing up their own uh, grant capacity development activities, local infrastructure hubs. So there's some really wonderful things going on outside the federal space that the federal agencies could really Know, support and lean on and leverage to really improve uh, the grants management ecosystem right now.